webinar. Uh, today's webinar is on control charting and process capability statements and will be presented by Forrest Breifogel, who uh, probably doesn't need much introduction among this audience, um, but I will go ahead and introduce him in a moment anyway. Uh, everyone's phones are going to be muted during the webinar, but if you have questions about the presentation or you're having any difficulties with the uh, webinar interface or anything, there is a questions uh, portion of the GoToWebinar interface you can use to type in questions, and those will be responded to. Uh, Forrest has been uh, the head of uh, Smarter Solutions for a number of years here. He's a professional engineer and ASQ fellow, as many of you may know. Um, he's this year's Quality Magazine's Quality Professional of the Year for 2011, and has recently won the Crosby Medal from ASQ. He's also written 13 books, uh, including a book many of us know, Implementing Six Sigma, and developed a highly successful integrated enterprise excellence system. So I'm sure uh, most of you are already familiar with Forrest's work in our field and uh, are very excited to hear him present today. So uh, without any other delay, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Forrest. Thank you, Joel. So I'm going to be talking about control charting and process capability statements but also issues and resolution. Uh, I'm going to be uh, you know, challenging some of the traditional ways we look at things. And I'm going to, uh, so it's going to uh, maybe be upsetting to some people. I don't know. But it's going to be challenging some of the things that we might have been taught in FTC 101. So basically, learning objectives that we're going to have is list issues with the X bar and R control charting and process capability reporting. We're just going to be laying it all out there. And then I'm going to describe an alternative approach. And I call it 30,000 foot level approach, which offers really predictive scorecards. So it's a methodology that can actually be applied not just for the manufacturing of widgets, but how we actually measure throughout the organization. I'm suggesting you can then replace the red, yellow, green scorecard. And I'm going to be talking about how you can go in and link these predictive scorecards within an overall business system. Now, if we go in and look at traditional control charts, we've seen them all, that um, we've got common cause variability as shown on the left-hand side. And then we've got a special cause condition. So the idea is whenever we have a special cause condition, we have right to go in and try to figure out what happened and resolve the issue. Now, if we've got a common cause issue, we really don't want to uh, go and tackle all the ups and downs. We uh, need to go in and change the process if we actually want to change a different level of state of the organization. Or we need to change the excess, so to speak, of our process in order to get a new level of performance. Now, if we go in and look at how traditional control charts are selected, I'm sure you've seen some sort of a decision tree that looks like this. So uh, we can, if we got a certain set of data, we might want to use an X bar and R chart, or a P chart, or a C chart, or U chart. So that's the traditional way of approaching it. What I'm going to be suggesting is a completely different way of viewing this. Now, one of the things before I get started, is this is still a little bit different. I was talking about 30,000 foot level uh, charting. So this it represents like the flight of an airplane. You're not getting in all the details. Now this is not really traditional control charting in some aspects because control charting is traditionally to identify when special causes occur and you stop the presses and fix those and then you move on. What I'm suggesting here is a 30,000 foot level cue of your process as a high-level uh, view of it. And um, so that's what we're going to end up be talking about here. Now, if we were presented information like this and we had to analyze it, we would uh, probably choose an X bar and R chart. I would venture to say most of you would select that. So we'd have five samples which in these subgroups. Now, we might like to have 30 um, uh, subgroups, but in this case, we're just going to be only having 10. Now, if we did a control chart on that particular uh, process, uh, what would we conclude? 
Well, I think the unanimous uh, vote out there would be that we've got an unstable process. So we have to go in and bring it into stability before we can really make an improvement. I'm sure that many of you have uh, heard that sort of suggestions over the time. So we're going to be revisiting really this uh, chart a little bit later and get into a little bit more details. But before I get into that, I really want to start talking about process capability because I think it's really important to talk about and link process capability with these particular control charting methods that we have. So if we went in and had a process that is in statistical control, as we see on the left-hand side, we might say also that the process is stable. And if we've got stability to it, we could then go in and build a histogram like we're shown on the left-hand side and then turn it on its side, then we get a probability density function. So that's basically the voice of the process talking to us. And then if we put specification limits on there, then we can go in and make a statement how the process is doing relative to our specification. We could look at perhaps percent nonconformance. Now, if we don't like what we see relative to that capability, then we have to do something fundamentally different to the overall process to actually go in and make a difference. Just reacting to all the ups and downs really doesn't really buy us very much, and it can lead us to a lot of firefighting activities that don't benefit us over the long haul. Now, if we go in and look at how people typically report process capability, we're we first off have to have a specification that we're going to compare it to. Now, statisticians often challenge how well these process capabilities do. And I'm going to build upon those challenges. However, customers really often ask for these indices, and they might put a requirement actually on their supplier to meet a certain level of process capability indice. But we need to understand that. Uh, there can be really some fundamental issues with putting together overall process capability. Now, if we look at the mathematics behind it, it is quite simple. You just look at the difference between the upper and lower specification limits and get that magnitude and divide it by the six times the standard deviation of the process. So what can be simpler? Not a very complicated relationship. However, We've got some challenges with it. That's what we're going to be getting into. Now, that's CP value. Now, if we looked at CP, uh, or let's look at the implication of a CP of 2.0. What does that mean? Well, that really means that the width of the specification uh, is about 12 standard deviations of how things are running. That's pretty good. Now, what are some key assumptions, though, when you get this metric? And that's what I think is really important here. You know, we first need to have an upper and lower specification limit, and also, in order to do this manually, we need to go in and have normally distributed data. So this is a picture of various uh, distributions, and and uh, we're going to next talk about how CPK is uh, calculated, because that's another process capability in this index uh, that we can use to describe how our process performance. And again, it's a rather simple relationship. But the only difference here is we're looking at how we're performing relative to the cold specification limit. So what's the implication of this? If it's CP of 1, which is shown in the figure below, that really indicates that three standard deviations from the closest spec limit. Okay, so that gives us a picture of how our process is performing. So these are quite simple relationships. Now, we can extend it to PP and PPK. So what's the difference? Okay, well, the difference is PP and, uh, PP and PPK is looking at all the data to look at the, how the distribution is performing relative to the specification limits. Now, CP and CPK calculations are somewhat over the short-term period. So the variation between subgroups really does not necessarily uh, impact 
the uh, how CP and CP calculations are occurring in the XBAR and R chart, for example. But these calculations are very sensitive to the standard deviation input. Now, there's differences of opinion and confusion around the calculation of the standard deviation. First, the standard equations that you typically see are for normally distributed data. Now, computer programs can address this issue if it's not normally distributed. However, you really need to make sure that this normality is checked before you apply these equations. Now, one thing that's often not really considered is that these calculations really need to go in and address regions of stability of your processes. So whenever I looked in these discussion groups, uh, LinkedIn and wherever else, a lot of times people are asking a process, a process capability, and they're not really addressing, is the process stable? Those are really important considerations when you're actually doing the calculation. Now, how are we going to calculate these, uh, these, uh, the variation, the standard deviation? Well, it depends upon how you collect the data. So if you've got indicated over here, like here, this would be a calculation that you might have if you have short-term variation, or you calculate short-term variation, and you're using an X bar and R chart. Here is if you've got an X bar and S chart. Over here is a different methodology for different equation, if you're going to calculate it using an individual's control chart. So the standard deviation that you're using in equation can be quite different depending upon how you're collecting the data. And it's been my experience, many people are just not aware of these differences. Now, if you go in and look at something that's long term, you know, this might be like a PP and PPK calculation. Then the thing is, we would um, go in and use a different equation completely here. So process capability issues, well, there's quite a few issues with process capability. Often what happens is people want to convert CP or K values to parts per million. But you really need to have CP and CPK if you have a two-sided specification on it. Something that often is not thought about. Very important. Talked about normality. And again, how it's calculated. And also how it's sampled. So in other words, you could have two different suppliers producing the same kind of parts but if they, one samples an X bar and R chart approach and another do it in individuals, you can actually get quite a bit different calculation or a result for the CP and CPK reported value. So let's go back and consider the data that I had originally. Remember that chart was very out of control. So technically we shouldn't even be calculating the process capability on it. Now, how are we going to report that? How are we going to report this? Well, we could go in and look at the CP number, CPK value. Well, look at that. The PP value is a lot different than the CP value here. If we look over here, look at those differences. Man, that's a big difference, right? That's maybe telling us something here. Or you might look at this value down here. But again, our process using an X bar and R chart was not in control. So technically, we shouldn't even be doing this. Forrest, we have a question on your last slide. What? Um, one more. Sorry about that. What standard deviation is the most appropriate about formula, short term or long term? Long term. And I'm going to be 
I'm going to be describing a different way completely, but this is the, uh, I'm just right now showing the issues with the CP and CPK value. So I'll be using basically that something that's more aligned with this. That's where I'm going to be leading to. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question for now, because we'll get into that a little bit more later. Thank you for the question. So, what if we examine only one of the subgroups? Somebody could do that, right? If you recall, I had five samples per subgroup, and I had ten subgroups. But if we took only the first sample, that's the first column basically, and look at an individual's chart, my goodness, we get a completely different picture. So if somebody were choosing an individual's chart, from this process to report it, they would say the process is in control or stable, where someone in doing an X bar and R chart would say it's out of control. What's the difference? Why do we have a difference to it? That is a very important question to address. And we're going to be talking about that. We're going to get into the why. But before we do that, let's look at the process capability statement that we have. Well, you get quite a different picture here. I don't know if you recall the number that we had down there, but that number is more is pretty consistent with what we have for the X4 and R chart. Also, if you happen to remember, this is not much different from what we had for the PP value and also the PPK value. But the CP value, CPK value that we had previous to an X4 and R chart is completely different. It was much larger. Now, another way of presenting this information is through a probability plot. Now, many people that have had Six Sigma training, they're looking at uh, using the probability plot to assess normality. And then you would look at a value like over here, uh, looking at the p-value to see if it's normally distributed, and hopefully it is, or if not, they sometimes go into cold sweats. Uh, shouldn't be that case, but that's what happens a lot of times. But what I'm suggesting, the probability plot is a way that we can actually report the capability of our process that's in easier to understand terms than the CP and CPK and PP and PPK values. Notice here we get a non-conformance rate of about 27%. So we're basically looking at the percentage of time that we're below the spec and also the percentage of time where we are above the spec. That's how we get that number is shown in that equation there. Now, if we compare our sample of one process capability statement, you'll notice that this value is approximately the same as that value that we have. Now, of the two approaches, I really prefer the probability plot. An advantage of that is now I can really see if it's not normally distributed, and I also can address that. I can see if maybe I have an outlier, and that can be very difficult to tell when you have a histogram. Now, let's compare our two control charting methods that we had. We had the X bar and R chart originally, and we had an individual's chart here. Same process. We just sampled from it differently. And we got completely different opinion about how our process was doing relative to stability. Now, why is that? Well, let's look at the equations in order to answer that question. If we go in and look at the equation for an X bar and R chart here, we notice that in order to calculate the upper and lower control limits, we take A2, which just is a constant, as we know, which would be different if we had a subgroup size of 5 versus 4 versus 3. Fundamentally, it's just a constant. And we then take that times R bar. 
Notice on the individual's chart, we're calculating it as 2.66 times the moving range, where 2.66 is just a constant because we're using uh, the adjacent values in a, an individual's chart to calculate the control limit. But what's really important is to look at our bar and compare it to moving range value. So the question is, where does the variability come from when we have these X bar and R charts? Is it within subgroups or is it between subgroups? Well, the answer is it's within subgroups. So you can see we're just averaging each one of these values. So if this particular distribution was way over here and it had the same width, it would not really impact our R bar at all. So the variability between the subgroups has nothing to do with the X bar and R control limit. That is a very big deal. People don't seem to talk about that very much. Where if you got the moving range, that is the variability between the subgroups. So that's why you can get very different pictures because how you're looking at it. We had one statistician that uh, was an international statistician, came out of Master Black Belt Train, and she couldn't sleep at night at that night after we described this to her, she said, I knew my processes wasn't out of control. But she was using an R bar, uh, using an X bar and R chart to look at it because the variability between subgroups has absolutely nothing to do with controlling. Now, the question is, is which one is right? Well, I guess we could say it depends. Depends upon how you view the world. Now, I'm going to use some quotes from Deming. He talks about a fault in the uh, a fault in the interpretation of observations seen everywhere. Suppose that every event is attributed to someone, usually close at hand, or related to a special cause. Well, we know that that's not really true. He talks also about we shall speak of faults of the system as common causes of trouble and faults from the fleeting events as special causes. Now that's a very important point. I want to come back to that one. He then talks about confusion between common cause and special causes lead to frustration of everyone that leads to greater variability and higher cost. Exactly what we don't want. And then he would say that most of our problems are common cause. Now, let's go back to this particular statement over here. Okay, the second statement. We shall speak of the faults of the system as common cause of trouble and faults of fleeting events as special cause. Okay, what's the implication of that? Well, let's consider we've got a process where raw material changes every day of the week. And it truly affects our output. Now the question, and we're not saying it causes us a problem, right? but it affects the output. The question is, should that be considered a source of common cause variability or a special cause? Now, I'm talking about just the normal ups and downs of the raw material line. Now most people that I've had in the, uh, discussions of this sort, will agree that it's really common cause variability. So therefore, we don't want to react to the day-to-day -day variability of our process uh, changes in raw material lots. We're not saying it's not a problem, but we don't want to react to that as though it's a special cause. That's the logic that most people would have. So if that's how we view the world, what does that mean relative to the selection of an individual's chart or an X bar and R chart? Well, it means basically that we should do an individual's chart because we want to have a system such that the variability between subgroups impacts our control limit. So we don't want to react to 
the variability within subgroups uh, alone, but we want to consider also the variability between subgroups. Now, what I really imply is that um, tree that we had originally for selection of the uh, control charts um, needs to be revisited in my mind. And I put together this uh, decision uh, tree, so to speak, on various situations. And I'm blowing up the top portion of it. So if we start looking at this, we've got a key process variable output metric using a continuous response whenever possible. Okay. Then what we're going to do is move up over to here. That's what we have for that particular situation that we described earlier where we had the um, uh, subgroup size of five uh, that we had. So now we come up here. It's continuous output. Now all transactions are available. We determine an infrequent subgrouping sampling period. What does that mean? Well, if, if you've got data, for example, from a call center, uh, the question is, do we have variability between the time of day on hold time? Well, I think the answer would be yes because um, there's just going to be different demands. Maybe in the afternoon it's going to always be higher. Next question I'll answer is uh, if we got differences between day of the week. In other words, maybe Friday is always higher uh, demand than we have the other time, so we might expect whole time to get larger. So we don't want to react to Friday as a special cause, because guess what? We're going to have Fridays that come around. Now, we're, notice we're not trying to use this to manage our business. That's another issue. We're trying to describe a high level, a 30,000 foot level view of how we are performing in our processes relative to hold time. So, so then we might ask the question, well, what about week of the month? Well, you know, we typically get some variability, but it's not that one week is higher than the other. So in that case, our infrequent subgrouping and sampling period would be maybe a week. So that's how we collect the data. So you notice at 30,000 foot level, we're really not trying to take a timely action. But we're really trying to describe from a high level point of view is our process stable. Okay. So if we got that situation moving on, then we come back over to here. We want to create an individual chart for the mean and the standard deviation of the, pro of the subgroups. Now often what you need to do for a standard deviation is to maybe take a logarithmic transformation because it's bounded by zero. So that's what I'm suggesting is a better way of doing it. So if we take that same set of data now, instead of using an X bar and R chart, and we plot the data as the mean of each of the subgroups as an individual's chart, and we also look at the log of the standard deviation, now what do we conclude? We conclude our process is stable. That's very different than what picture we had with the X bar and R chart, as you see here. That's the same set of data looking at it two different ways. And the difference is, just to reiterate, is the X bar and R chart doesn't have any consideration of variability between subgroups when it's calculating the control limits. Now the next question is, what is the capability of it? And I was suggesting that I like probability plot. So if we've got a recent region of stability, then what we can do is we can say our process is predictable. Now we've got red, yellow, green scorecards are not predictable. Stack bar charts are not predictable. Pie charts are not predictable. That's like driving your car looking up the at the rear, uh, rear view mirror. We want to look out the windshield. So we're saying our process is predictable, looking at the two charts from up here. So this is the only thing we make a statement is, is our process predictable or not? And if it is, then we can go in and make a statement about its prediction. So in order to do that, we actually go to the raw data. So we had. 10 subgroups, we had five per subgroup, so we really got 50 data points over here. 
Now it doesn't look real nice and pretty for as lining up to the uh, uh, probability plot, you know, for as normality goes, because it's really got two different distributions to it. I won't disagree. There's going to be variability within subgroups and variability between. But you know, it does a pretty good job. And it also puts it in terms that everybody understands. We can look at the percentage that's above here, so that's about 19% or so, and look at the percentage below this. So we end up with a 27% nonconformance. And if you recall previously, that's pretty much what I had uh, shown previous from a long-term point of view. So now what we can do is we can say our process is stable and it's predictable, and we estimate that we have about a 27% nonconformance. Now, there are really some similar problems to P charts, U charts, and C charts. So I'm suggesting an individual's chart is an approach to really uh, address issues with these particular charts of charting also. Now, first, we have a question. Okay. Where can we find the decision tree for selection of control charts? That seems to be fundamental step of control charting. Okay. Well, what I have there is uh, I got a couple of books that's got that. It's got the Project Execution Guide, Lean Six Sigma uh, uh, Project Execution Guide, and also it's in the Volume Three, Implementing uh, or Integrated Enterprise Excellence, Volume Three. So if you're interested in that, um, uh, just send me an email. I have my email address, and we can you know even give you a coupon code for discount off of it. Um, if that would be uh, helpful for you. And um, it's got a decision tree that also addresses with the C and U charts. Okay? Very good. So the next question we have is uh, how can we actually apply this more than just for manufacturing the widgets? Well, what I'm suggesting, you can actually go in and use this as how you would report out your scorecards. Now, if you go in and look at a high-level view of how an organization performs, you might have develop product, market product, sell product, produce, invoice, and report financial. Very high-level stuff. And then you can have some other support functions, IT and so on. But those are not shown here. Now, each of those rectangle boxes represents the processes that you're doing within the organization. Now, each of those functions that you have, you would like to go in and get good metrics for it. So let's look at produce and deliver products. So if we look at that from a producing uh, a, you know, time, uh, quality, time, and cost, we look at, we could come out defective rate, lead time, whip, on-time delivery, and maybe theory constraints throughput, or financial metrics. Those might be good metrics that we could have. So the organization chart basically is subordinate to this. So now the question is, how do you go in and link your metrics within this overall value chain? So the idea is, you can create your processes here where you can go in and click on these various procedures. Put my pointer over here. Like produce and deliver product. You can click on that, this part right in here, and then that's going to give you all your procedures. And then the idea is if you click over here, it's going to give you a metric and how it's performing, where you can pull it basically from your database. And then what it's going to do is present the information like this. And notice now, you're going to be making a statement relative to something that everybody else can relate to. So we got a predictable process of about 27% nonconformance. So I'm suggesting you can use the methodologies that I'm talking about here for 30,000 foot level reporting, not only for manufacturing and how we normally look at quality, but you can also 
put those into an overall organizational scorecard system. So basically, in this session, we talked about issues with traditional XBAR and R charting. We talked about an alternative 30,000 foot level metric. We talked about linkage of performance scorecards to an organizational value chain. So we got some time for questions and answers here. Um, the first question, may I apply CBK or CT in an insurance company? I've, I'm really not a big fan of CP and CPK, but you can apply 30,000 foot level charts within an insurance company. So uh, let's, for example, look at uh, what metric you might have in the in insurance uh, industry. Uh, you might have something that's uh, how long does it take to process a claim? Okay. Now, the way I would suggest doing that is uh, you might look at the number of, first off, you want to see if it's a predictable process, a two-step process here. So then what you could look at is, um, and you might look at it as a weekly, or you could look at it as monthly. I wouldn't do it any more frequently than weekly. So let's say we come back weekly. Because there you got the weekends, because I imagine everybody's not working on Saturdays and Sundays. So what we would have at the end of the week, we would have how many claims were actually processed and how long it took them. If it's still in the pipeline, we don't count that. So we're looking at, and we may have 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 claims. It doesn't matter. We would then try plot the average value that we have for duration. We'd also plot the standard deviation along with the standard deviation. I would venture to say your process is probably predictable. You know, you may have something that's a little longer for the holiday season, which you might want to exclude, but I would venture to say your process is predictable. Next question is, what do you predict? You would go back and look you know, you're looking at it weekly, and you keep going back. And I don't care if you got 10 years of data. I'm not bounded by calendar year. You then collect all the data from your recent region of stability, and then you plot that on a probability plot. Now, that plot may not be normally distributed. It might be log normal. So I'm not. That's okay. And you could just maybe take a log normal transformation on it. Now, in the case that you're talking about for the insurance industry, is you really don't have a specification. Not like if you're manufacturing widget. You might have a goal, but you don't have a specification. Now, you could go and do a probability plot off your goal and say, hey, 20% of the time it takes us longer than what we've agreed to. That's OK. But let's say you don't have a specification. You could report the median value and 80% frequency of occurrence. And then that kind of describes uh, the variability or process that you have. OK, we, our next question is, so what is the real utility of rational subgrouping if they lead us to misleading metrics? Well, I'm suggesting, um, first off, we have to miss, uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. I'm, I want to have. Metrics that lead to the right behaviors. I'm talking about the three R's of business. Everybody doing the right things, doing them right at the right time. That's what I really want to do. And I don't want people to address common cause variability as though it's special cause. If you don't like the response that you're having relative to that insurance company example we're talking about, you have to go in and do something fundamentally different to your process. And what I'm trying to do with this overall methodology is to have managers asking for a project to be completed in their area that affects their metric. So for example, it's take too long to do an insurance claim, and I'm responsible to do this activity to improve it, that manager, and he doesn't know how to do it. So now he's asking the black belt, the master black belt, to get this project done timely because it's important to them. So that's an important metric. Now the subgrouping 
that I've talked about is very important to infer the subgroup in sampling. Because if you take sampling that's too frequent, what can happen is you've got autocorrelated data. It depends upon what happened previously. And so you might have some trends up and down. And if you recall on in the individual's chart, the control limits are calculated by the moving range. So if you go in and start having frequent samples, then your moving range is going to get really small, or could get really small, and it's going to look like you've got a lot of out of control conditions. And the reason is, is because you've got this autocorrelation to it, and I'm doing infrequent subhuman sampling to kind of break that up. And and because I don't want to react to all those uh, changes that we have in the process. Because things are going to drift, and I just don't want to react to that. Because I consider that a source of common cause variability. Not saying we don't have a problem, but I don't want to react to it as though it's a special cause. Again, with this approach, is different than traditional control charts, in that I'm not trying to use it to identify special causes to say stop the press and fix that. I'm trying to take a high level view and then determine where I should be focusing my improvement efforts and then be due diligence to address those. Okay, thanks for all the great questions. We have a lot more in queue. So our next question is, what is the statistical premise behind log transformations of standard deviation? Okay. Um, if you've got, when people go in and take transformations um, of when they're doing control charts or they're doing uh, capability assessments, sometimes uh, they pull it out of the air. It really needs to make physical uh, sense. Uh, so if you've got a process, for example, that's bounded by zero, uh, you can't go in and do that tail to infinity on the left end, especially if your process is operating around zero or close to zero. So you're going to have a natural boundary. So if you have this natural boundary, it's going to tend to have a tail to the right. Well, that's how standard deviation performs. You can't get a minus standard deviation. So it's going to be bounded by zero. Now, if you've got several samples to it, like above 10 or 20 or 30, depends on the situation, a normal distribution can often be uh, adequate to represent it. But if you get down and you've got fewer samples in your subgroup, uh, you might need to take a, stand, uh, a log normal transformation uh, to address that situation of boundary of zero. Okay, our next question. Control limits are extreme compared to X bar chart and show perhaps more acceptable variation compared to the spec when looking at capability. How do you justify this and explain it to a non stats person who has been well versed in understanding control limits? Well, one thing I'll offer here, if somebody sends me an email message, uh, I do have, uh, this is a published article on this topic, and I can also uh, send you something on T-charts or whatever. So if you want me to go in and send you an article on this that you could go in and walk that person through, I'm more than happy to do that. Just jot my email address uh, down and then uh, um, shoot me an email and I'll send you an article that you can use to walk them uh, through this overall uh, concept that we talked about today. But uh, you have to have somebody that's an open mind when you're starting to talk about this because it's a, it's a really big deal, uh, but people don't tend to talk about it. And what I would suggest is you would go in and take some existing data that you have and try to, to use this methodology and see what you come away with. Uh, and, and you can go in and, and uh, use some statistical programs to randomly create data and do this. This is a, something that um, often people uh, could be resistance to it initially, but it's been my experience that when uh, people go in and start looking at it this way, they say, oh my gosh, just like that statistician from, uh, from, uh, from Europe, uh, she got really excited. And that's how they do it now throughout their plant. And it changed completely behaviors on what they have. But it's, it's like I said, just different. And this article hopefully would, would help convey the methodology to somebody else. Okay, and our next question. 
If you could go to slide 25 for us, how does this slide help make decisions on the within and between data? Okay. The what this chart is doing, it's it's also it's assuming that that raw material lot to lot example that we just talked about is a source of common cause variability. So it's always it's leading to individuals charts. It all it does that same thing for a P chart instead of a P chart for attributes. And so that's the fundamental uh, basis for this overall um, decision tree that we have right here. So now. I'm not sure the question is, is how do you determine this, the infrequent subgrouping and sampling? Is that's what you have to do is walk people through it. And it's really quite easy. You know, you do something just like I was talking about that insurance example. Say, well, do you believe that as far as the claim time could depend upon time of day? Well, of course. You know, uh, what about uh, the uh, day of the week? Well, yeah, because we've got weekends in there. So you start going through this sort of logic. Then you can go in and lead to uh, answering this question over here. That's the key one right there that I think you're talking about. And that's really dealing with the physics, physical situation that you're encountering. Um, now, I've got also in this decision tree what happens if you've got safety you know, incidents, which don't hopefully happen very often, the serious ones anyway. I've got another approach to do it where you look at the time between incidences instead of doing a C and new chart. So that deals with all the logic uh, of most situations that, that people encounter. Now keep in mind, this is 30,000 and I am not trying to control the process. Uh, to call the process, you might uh, you use like a pre-control chart. So when do I redress the grinding wheel and change things like that or add another person in the call center or something like that. I'm not trying to do that. I am trying to do from a 30,000 foot level point of view. Okay. If you are not a big fan of the CP, CPK, or PP, PPK process capability, I assume you prefer the IMR control chart. Can this be applied to maintenance process capability? I'm thinking about using MTTR, mean time to repair, for maintenance effectiveness. Your thoughts? Well, first off, I, I listed an, an IMR or an XMR chart. I don't end up typically doing the moving range piece because it complicates things, you know, as far as explaining it to the person. So I look at that, but I think you're right on is doing the mean time to repair. So now you plot the mean time to repair that you're going to be going in and looking at. So in this particular case that you would have, you would look at uh, uh, the 30,000 foot level. You've got all transactions are available. These uh, subgroups, now in this case, you would do every time you repair it. Now, in this case, you might have to take a transformation on it. Depends upon how long it takes to repair. If it takes like three days, well, you're probably not. But if you're down into the minutes, it's see it's bounded by zero. So you might have to do a transformation. And then what you do is do an individual's chart on it. Now, I have also listed there, I don't show it in this particular uh, slide deck, but I have another decision tree on how you calculate the capability indice. Okay. So in this particular case, you would go in and do a, a probability plot on it. And again, you might have to take a transformation on it. And then you would look at the median time and 80% of the frequency. So in other words, the median time, it takes me uh, uh, 72 minutes. And 80% of the time, it takes me between uh, 40 and 95 minutes to do that. Everybody understands that. Now, should we fix that? Well, I don't know. We need to look at the overall value chain like this to figure out where we should be focusing our effort. Because what we want to do from a business point of view, go in and, and look at this. For case of mean time to repair, if somebody says, should I take this on a project, I'd ask the question, uh, what if you made more widgets? Could you sell them all? If the answer is yes, I say, well, my goodness, yes, probably should. But if you say, well, no, I said, well, maybe you ought to be working on your sales and marketing process because you, know, you could sell more widgets. So you really want to focus projects that affect the big picture, and that's part of this overall methodology, too. Okay, and the next question. What is the best formula to calculate 
sigma for a batch process where only two data points are generated a month. Only have, we only have 33 data points so far. Well, first off, I wouldn't do the sigma level, okay, because that's very, uh, I, I'm assuming you're talking about sigma quality level, we're running at six or 5.3 sigma levels and so on. I'm not a big fan of that approach at all. I would like to a method, describe it, that you have uh, in terms that every other, everyone understands. Now, if you've got 33 data points, what was the, what was the question again? What was he measuring? Um, it was a batch process. It's a batch process. Just one second. Well, whatever your output of your batch is, okay, it uh, may be uh, uh, viscosity or something. I don't know. Okay, so it's to say it's viscosity. So you've got 33 data points. Okay, those are batches. Okay, so now when you come back over and looking at this decision tree that we talked about here, okay, if you come back over here, you're going to use again all the data points, and then you're going to might have to take a transfer, make transformation, probably not going to be necessary, and oops, I moved on And then now we're going to create an individual's control chart on it. And then what we want to do is take a probability plot Oh, if it's a stable process of all 33 data points. And then now you're going to look at, give a best estimate of viscosity. That's the output of your, your batch process. And, and now you can make a statement relative to specifications. If you've got those limits, you might say, hey, out of the batches, it looks like 5% uh, uh, of them are not giving us the desired results that we, we want for the viscosity. Okay, and our next question, how do you recommend going about establishing specification limits for a customer when using a variable control chart? Well, okay, I wouldn't use the specifications and control charts in the same sentence. You know, the, um, the specifications are what the customer needs. Okay, remember, the specifications are addressing cap process capabilities. So what we want to do first off to determine if our process is stable. You know, that's what the control charts do. Nothing more. They don't make process capability statements control charts. That's not good. I know people like to try to do that, but that's not a good practice. So what we then go in, uh, if we'd ask the customer, you know, what's it important for? Why are you using it? And those should be independent of our process. This is going to be success for the customer. Now, say the customer doesn't know what they are. Okay, sometimes that'll be. So we might look at um, uh, even uh, day sales outstanding, sent on invoice, how long it gets back. We don't have a specification for that either. Okay? So if they don't give you a specification, don't worry about it. Okay, so what I do is I would track it using a 30,000 foot approach. If it's stable, okay, then what I do is I take the, the data from the recent region of stability, do a probability plot on it, and then I report the median value and 80% of the recent occurrence. So, for example, let's say, uh, let's say the, the viscosity that you're looking at here for the customer, and they're not sure what they need. Okay, what you do is you say, this is what my process is performing in the medium to such and such centipoise, and 80% of the time it's between here and here. Customer, is that okay? Okay, if they're saying it's okay, why rock the boat? Because you, your process is given what they want. And you can, you can monitor and make sure it doesn't change. And that's what the control charts will do. Now, I'll establish that if it's not good enough, the proof of the pudding, and I'm talking about lean projects or whatever, is you want to see these 30,000 foot level charts move to a new level of stability, and now we get a good uh, performance that's more desirable. Okay, one more question. How can you calculate process capability when using attribute data, okay. i.e. using a U chart? No. There. Okay, well, I'd say, are you going to use, okay, if you're using a U chart, you're probably using count data. Okay, so, uh, but if, let's say for an attribute chart, you got a P chart. Okay, what you're doing here, and I described this as another article that you can request that I send to you if you want. It's dealing with why P charts don't work. And I got another one why U charts and C charts are not so good either. But let's take a P chart. So we're talking about attribute, pass or fail. So what you do, uh, first off, you try to get um, a subgroup size that's going to be consistent or 
somewhat consistent. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, but it's somewhat consistent. But you're going to be plotting, and again, this is my overall roadmap, you're plotting the failure rate okay, that you have. And then you're, you're plotting that on an individual's chart. Because a P chart, like the X bar and R chart, the variability between subgroups has absolutely nothing, as in zero, to affect the control limit. That is a big deal. Nobody seems to talk about it. Big deal. So if you got a big enough sample size, subgroup size, you're going to almost invariably indicate that the process is out of control. Okay? Because the variability between subgroups has nothing to do with limits. So you're doing an individual's chart of the rate. Now, if it's stable using an individual's chart, then what you do is you look at the, if it's the subgroup size is exactly the same, you look at the center line. So now I'm tracking it and I got a 2% knock quantity. Now, if the subgroup size is not exactly the same, what you do is look at, in the recent region of stability, you go in and look at all the data. How many widgets did you make? Divide that into the number of failures that you had. And that's your process capability. Notice here, with this approach, we are both for continuous data and attribute, we're reporting it the same way. We've got a predictable process and we've got a 3% problem. We're doing that same for continuous data and attribute. So it's a lot better than doing the CP and CPK and PP and PPK, which nobody understands anyway. Okay, and since it's getting close, this will be our last question. Is it possible to use CPK when the data do not follow a normal distribution? May I use other distributions like y rule? Yeah. Again, um, you can use a y rule distribution uh, to do that, but it really is important that you have one that makes physical sense. Okay? It's, it makes physical sense uh, because uh, sometimes people do the Box-Cox transformation and get weird distributions. And there's one that makes physical sense. Log normal is, is one that's really popular. If you're dealing with attribute data, you know, I talked about an individual's chart, you might have to take a square root transformation. And there's physical, technical reasons why these make physical sense. So that's really important. And the rival could be useful, you know, if you've got certain distributions that uh, make physical sense. But that is really important. But sometimes what people have is they got two different distributions and they're trying to do something crazy to go in and, and, and make it look like one, and it's really not a good thing to do. You need to look at them separately. So, or you might have an outlier or something else. So just kind of be able to be careful of that. Now, I can also, I think there's some more questions. Right? You know, if we've got some more questions, uh, I can go in and put together a response to these other questions here. And then if you're interested in a response, to it, you can just email me, and then I can, I can send you... Uh, what I thought was a response to each one of them. Okay, yeah, let me go in. Now I've got a good point. So this is the my email address here. So if you want to uh, get in contact with me for whatever reasons, if you find this beneficial or have any questions about what we talked about here, uh, don't hesitate to contact me. So uh, I guess is Joel going to take it over here? Or yeah. Is that Thank you again, Forrest, for uh, presenting with us, and hopefully everybody uh, has been able to uh, take down Forrest's contact information if you have any follow-up questions on what was presented or anything today. Uh, we have been recording the webinar, so uh, we're working on getting those posted on the ASQ Stat Division website in the future, so uh, be sure to check that out. I'm sure we will uh, communicate that once uh, our webinars are available on the website. So thanks again for everyone for attending, and thank you, Forrest, for uh, presenting for us today. I'm sure uh, everyone found it very valuable. You're welcome. Everyone have a great day. Thank you, then.